I'd like to welcome everybody to the October webinar uh, with the Maine Aquaculture Innovation Center. Uh, we are really excited this week to be speaking with Amanda Mosier. Um, I'll tell you a little bit more about her presentation in just a minute. But before then, um, we wanted to share out some information about the Minorities in Aquaculture um, census that they're doing right now. Uh, Annie, do you, would you mind saying just a couple words about that? Absolutely. So the Minorities in Aquaculture um, Network have, like many people, recognized that we do not have very much data regarding the experiences and needs of communities that are traditionally underrepresented in aquaculture. And so they have been funded and are in partnership with the Pew Charitable Trusts to carry out a, a survey to actually start to collect some data and some evidence from which we can then take forward different initiatives. So they have um, encouraged anybody that's received this survey to share it with others. And to that um, end, I'm just going to put the link into the chat for the survey and I think you can access the survey from their website and reach out awesome. to minorities in aquaculture for more information okay perfect thank you so much um yeah so definitely check that out it's really important for the industry and for us as people working in it so um the other just housekeeping thing is that I wanted to briefly share the new MAIC logo with everybody. So we're really excited to be celebrating 35 years of the Maine Aquaculture Innovation Center. And we have recently um, worked on this logo, which we're going to be using now. And feel free to reach out to MAIC if you would like copies of this logo that you can put on different um, posters or um, emails or whatever it is that you need to put it on for um, as a partner organization. So definitely reach out to us about that. Uh, and finally, the most important thing is introducing Amanda. So Amanda was part of a farmer to farmer exchange program um, when she went to Mexico to work with a women's run oyster cooperative and she's going to tell us about her experience which is awesome and also we just wanted to mention that the farmer to farmer exchange program is um, funding from maic and some partner organizations that will that allows people to go and visit and exchange knowledge and experience with other farmers um, in the United States and beyond. And so this program is still open for application. If you are interested in applying, we encourage you to apply and um, we will put some information in the chat uh, shortly about how you can do that. Um, and I will hand it over to you now, Amanda. So thank you so much for joining us. Thanks. Okay, I'm just gonna open up my screen. Oh, let's see. Awesome. Can you see it okay? Yep, yeah, we can see it. And I'm going to just turn my camera off because you can see my face also. <laughs> Ah, so okay. There it goes. Perfect. Okay, so um, this is definitely not an academic presentation. It's essentially just a collection of photos with a couple of videos of my trip to Puerto Penasco, Mexico, and I also plan to share some photos and information about the methods they use at the Women's Oyster Farm Cooperative. Um, talk about cooperatives in Mexico more broadly, and then what were some of my main takeaways from the trip. 
So I originally found out about this co-op through a video online that featured um, the women growing oysters in an estuary near Puerto Penasco. And they had a huge uh, membership at the time the video was shot. I believe it was over a hundred women who had been working collectively for 30 plus years. Um, I just thought it was really fascinating that it was such an involved community project and was curious to learn more about how and why they were growing oysters where they're located. So thankfully uh, from the MAIC grant, I was able to go there in person and get more background and learn the real story. So um, I think that's a video, but basically I took a van uh, from Phoenix down to the border of Mexico and then crossed the border to Mexico. Um, I did the land border crossing. This is uh, one of the points along the border, uh, border where there's a lot of uh, migration. And just to point out where Puerto Penasco is, I don't have a cursor, but you can see where that black arrow ends. It's in the north part, northeast corner of the Gulf of California. Um, in the middle of the desert, it's across from Baja. And I wanted to show this satellite image just so you can see how the entire town is surrounded by impenetrable desert. And that's the, in the top right-hand corner, that's the U.S.-Mexico border. So when I arrived, um, Javier picked me up and showed me the town. He's the grandson of one of the women that founded this cooperative. Um, I think it's actually over 40 years ago. So Puerto Penasco is a fishing port. And now they have a lot of second homes. There are U.S. citizens from Phoenix that frequent Puerto Penasco. And then there's a lot of tourism. So this part of the Gulf of California is called, well, by people in the U.S., Arizona's ocean. So a lot of people come down here in the winter. You can see some of the high-rise hotels in the background. And I'll uh, talk a little bit later about how this is becoming an issue, but it's a fishing and tourism dependent community, which is similar to a lot of places in Maine. Uh, here's a photo of the family I stayed with, Javier, Aurora, and Zenny. Um, it was really nice to stay with the family on this trip because I did get to work alongside them, but then I also got to know them inside the home and learn about what their lives are like. Javier does work at the oyster farm and works with his family. Aurora works in tourism. And Javier is also an English professor, so that's why I stayed with him, because we were able to converse. My Spanish isn't that good. Here's a picture of the fishing port in Puerto Penasco. There are hundreds of boats. These are primarily shrimp fishing boats. And on the right hand side, you can see this statue in town of a fisherman riding a giant shrimp. So the shrimping has been a huge part of this community. And it's a still a economically viable industry. And then these are, they also have um, some people that fish by lanchas or some people call them pangas in other places. They're small fiberglass boats that look a lot like my boat that they trailer. And I took these pictures because it reminds me of some of the launches here in Maine. Where you just see all the trucks and trailers and people going out for the day. The oyster farms that I visited were all located within one estuary. It's the Marua Estuary. And this is just outside of the port. Here's a satellite image where you can kind of see the rows of oysters. I wish I could point to them, but they're these black uh, lines in the northern part of the estuary. You can also see a few buildings.
And this is what the one part of the farm looks like. Um, basically, it's intertidal uh, oyster aquaculture. The tide drains out. It's very shallow. And the water is pretty warm, as you can imagine. It's a kind of a hard, sandy bottom. And they have lines with um, what are actually floating cages that they built themselves. Um, here is one of the families working together. This was another one of, uh, I'll go back. So this is a photo of the site that's operated by the cooperative and how it works is um, each woman has uh, her own lines and everything is color coded. So one, one family might be red, another family's blue, another's green, and the cages are color coded. That's how they keep their gear and space separated. So they're they're all operating at this site uh, within one lease, but there are several other leases in this estuary that are owned and operated by women. So here's another one of the oyster farms. This is a woman working in the eastern southeastern part of the estuary who also runs um, a little raw bar from home. And I really love this picture because it looks very similar to what my farm looks like. If there wasn't a lot of sand in the background, I probably couldn't tell the difference. On the left-hand side, I'm just showing what they use for anchors. They're, they're enormous and they're extremely heavy. So they have these, um, like anchor lines that run from shore out into the estuary. And then they use, you know, floating lines to attach the gear to. And the gear that they're using are, they're basically like layered milk crates. And then the, the, they put a layer of styrofoam on the top and then tie it all together. So they, this is something they came up with themselves. Uh, a long time ago. I think I have a close-up. Don't have a close-up picture, but these are just layers of trays and you can see there's purple on these trays. So that indicates whose gear it is. And then I took this photo just to show that there is some natural recruitment in the estuary. But the, the women that are a part of the cooperative, so, you know, similar to here, buy seed from a hatchery. They call it a laboratory. And that is one of the biggest bottlenecks that they're experiencing right now. I just wanted to show this photo too. Um, right now, uh, oyster production is actually a pretty big industry in Baja, Sinaloa and um, the part of Sonora where I was located. This is a picture of one of the farms in Baja. So this is on the Baja Peninsula, south of California. So, and it's a little more intensive culture, but it's still intertidal. Now moving on to the cooperative, I should just also mention that they're growing Pacific oysters and they're just really beautiful. I was a little envious of their oysters. Um, one thing I should also note at their farm is that they don't have water or electricity at the site. They don't use any sort of power equipment for washing oysters, um, removing fouling. So you can see they sell their oysters with barnacles on them. They don't use tumblers or any um, sorting equipment either. And at the peak of their cooperative, I think they were producing about 2 million oysters a year. So quite, quite a lot. In, in addition to the actual oyster farm, the cooperative owns um, a piece of land right on the estuary that has um, a number of different houses where at, at some points in their lives, the women lived and raised their children. Right now, it's primarily 
They each have their own gear storage area. And then there's a really popular restaurant where a lot of people come by dune buggy or vehicles, uh, just regular cars to purchase oysters. They have a, a raw bar and some other food options. How the cooperative operates the restaurant is that the infrastructure is owned by the cooperative, um, such as the building, but all of each family runs the restaurant for like, they get one week each in a rotation. So all of the, the one family will buy all of the supplies for the, restaurant that week they'll truck in water they're responsible for pumping out the septic as well and then they harvest their own oysters they sell their own oysters and keep all those proceeds then at the end of the week that family packs out and another family moves in to operate the restaurant uh, here's a picture of the restaurant from the outside they sell Raw oysters, they sell oyster shooters, quesadillas with shrimp. And just here's another photo of their oyster. I thought it was really pretty. They have beautiful cups. And here's a photo of the view from the restaurant. You can see why people like coming here. It's right on the water. They have music. Uh, they have beer and uh, soda. I think one other thing I forgot to mention at the beginning is that I visited this farm uh, during summer solstice. So it was extremely hot. The sun is intense. It's, you know, in the Sonoran Desert, uh, the temperatures were well above 100. And that would be the equivalent of visiting my oyster farm in February. <laughs> So the conditions were pretty extreme. We worked very early in the morning and then the restaurant was open later into the day. Just gonna show a quick video of the restaurant. So in addition to selling oysters at the restaurant, they also sell wholesale to distributors. Um, they do not sell oysters. When they're selling to, to distributors, it's not a cooperative effort. They're not branded as the same oyster. They um, each are responsible for their own sales. And right now there are only eight members. They're all women. Um, but then each woman, they're, you know, they're typically like a mother or a grandmother that have been doing this for a long time. And then their entire family also works at the oyster farm and at the restaurant. So it's not just women, it's men and women, it's uncles, cousins, daughters, sons, all their extended families. So there are eight members, but there are, you know, probably a hundred people at least that are involved in running the operation and the restaurant. Um, the best part about the trip is that there was just so much family and food involved. Um, on the left-hand side, this is one of the women that's a member of the cooperative and on the side, they're starting a cake making business. So every day we got to try different kind of cake. This was the birthday cake they made me. And then on the right hand side, this was our shrimp ceviche beach day. Um, we just, we ate probably six times a day and they were so generous with their 
um, sharing their food and their culture. It was definitely the farming is family centric and the, the lifestyles is as well. I also learned how to make uh, tortillas and gorditas and they fed me two breakfasts a day. They were also really excited to show me all the different parts of town and introduce me, me to like all the different culinary things. So some of the things I learned on this trip um, are really relevant to my own farm and I think issues in Maine. I was, I was surprised by how similar the challenges are in Mexico um, to here. So one thing that is unique though is that water diversion is a big issue with all of the hotels and development of second homes and limited uh, freshwater resources. A lot of the waters that used to go to the town is now being diverted to the hotels and uh, second home communities. So consistent freshwater supply at people's homes is challenging and expected to get worse. There's also a lot of coastal development surrounding the estuary, which is leading to issues related to water pollution. So this oyster farm cooperative, they're environmentalists. They're very committed to protecting this body of water. But there's a lot of money involved and um, hotels can build kind of wherever they want um, if they have enough money. Uh, one issue that they're facing is seed supply. Oyster aquaculture is booming in Sinaloa, which is just south of Sonora. And so they're competing with them for seed and face shortages or erratic supply. At the time I was visiting, I was actually waitlisted for seed. So it was a feeling that I could certainly relate to. They mentioned needing more hatcheries or labs in a more uh, reliable source of seed. Like I mentioned, they're competing with other states. I think my head is blocking this news article, but um, basically uh, uh, this is a photo of someone in Sinaloa. Sinaloa, there are over 80 cooperatives. Um, fishing and farming in Mexico is typically structured as a cooperative. So that's why it's, they're not they're not necessarily individual businesses, but um, they're competing with other regions, which is you know something we also share in Maine. We're competing with states like Massachusetts and elsewhere. I was really interested to go here because of the length of time they've been in business. Uh, some on my first day, one of the cooperative members asked me how long I've been farming oysters, and I said eight years. And she said, I've been doing this 38 years and I really appreciated um, her perspective. So as they've aged, their, I guess their, their needs and abilities have evolved. Um, some women have become, you know, that they've entered their seventies and eighties and have become, um, less are able to participate in the farming itself but then some of their children have joined the cooperative and taken on their share. There are a portion of members that are wanting to recruit some of their, um, some of the time and money that they've put into it. So they're, the land that they hold together is very valuable. And like a lot of farmers, they are facing pressure to sell to development. So there is some challenge and in inherent conflict in, you know, when it's a shared group decision and some people might want to sell the property, some wouldn't sell it if you offered them a billion dollars. Um, that was one, one way I think I was able to be helpful is that I talked to them about um, conservation easements, waterfront, working waterfront protection, things that we, we have options for in Maine. That was something they had never heard of. But since it's a very 
ecologically valuable area and they have such a, a strong group and incredible property, it seems like um, there should be some way for them to be, some way for this land to be protected in perpetuity with an agricultural use still tied to it so that they don't have to sell um, to developers. I, what I learned is that, well, I kind of already knew this, but simplification is a form of innovation. I feel like the simpler things are, the less likely they are to malfunction and that we have a tendency to think like bigger is better, more efficient is better. Um, the more working pieces, the more <laughs> evolved something is. But I think simplifying things is can can be even better. So like one thing I, I spend a lot of money on the hardware associated with my lines, like the shackles and they use knots. They don't use any of that. Um, so I think it's a way where I can simplify my own gear setup. And then also I just love intertidal aquaculture and that's how it's, you know, it's all conducted that way in Mexico. And it's, I think, a real missed opportunity here in Maine because of how difficult it is and the uncertainty around ownership of intertidal lands. Um, I really wish there was more opportunity to work in shallow water. Uh, let's see, cooperative structures. I guess I just wanted to point out that they they share ownership of land and physical assets, but they don't share uh, gear or equipment um, or sell collectively. So there are other ways of doing it. In terms of gender relationships, since these were family units working together, it's men and women working side by side. And there was also a lot of intergenerational equity where you know, children, children up to you know, great grandparents were working together. And then I thought, I thought it was really valuable for the women just to have a visitor. There were some, some fishermen from the port came to the oyster bar and the women were really proud to say, you know, this is Amanda, she's here from the US and she's learning from us because you know, we have experience and knowledge to share. So I think um, personally through my own travels, I've learned a lot from people that are situated in the global South and other countries. I think a lot of people look to like Japan and Norway and Iceland and other Nordic countries that are involved in like colonialism and there's actually a lot we can gain from looking at cultures in developing countries that have really have a, you know, a history of cooperation and collaboration and community building and working together as groups. And then I guess we'll just end too. I learned a lot about the importance of wearing sunscreen while I was there. And it's something that I wish I would have taken more seriously when I started oyster farming because I was able to see the effects of repeated sun exposure over a period of 40 years. And granted, it is really intense in Mexico in the, the desert, desert climate, but it's also pretty intense here if you're working on the water daily and not protecting your skin. So that's taking like the physical health safety uh, and protecting yourself from UV sun exposure. Um, that was very important. And here's just the photo of us all swimming off into the sunset. This was a different estuary. You actually can't swim in the estuary where the oyster farm is located to prevent, uh, it's supposedly for preventing pollution. And that's all I have for photos 
and information, but I'd be happy to um, discuss any of this with you. Thank you so much. That was so, so cool. Um, I know a bunch of people on our team actually have questions, so we would love to just chat with you a little bit more. Um, Emily, I can pass it to you and, and Sydney for a couple of these. And then I'll jump back in, but. Sure, I had a, I'll, I'll start with one question and then we can move on to somebody else and come back to me. But, um, so my first question, so I know this is a women led cooperative, but is that unusual for the area or are women more represented in the industry there compared to in the US? It is not unusual. I think um, just in my like travels and awareness, oyster women's women run oyster cooperatives occur in every part of the world. And in Mexico, women's cooperatives are um, really common. They might have be based around different economic drivers such as ecotourism or fishing or working in conservation and ecosystem monitoring. But it's common for there to be women's cooperatives separated from men's cooperatives. Are there, I mean, just thinking beyond the cooperative model, just women in the industry? Are there more women in the industry in Mexico than you think that there are here? Just from your experience? Oh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I was only in one specific area. So yeah, there were far more, the proportion of women to men in this area was much greater. Um, Chris, you had a question. Do you want me to ask it or do you want to ask it? Oh, I'm glad to. Hi, Amanda. Um, Hi. Uh, yeah, a question about what did you learn about the governance model for the co-ops and are they adaptable here? Oh, that's a really good question. So it's basically the decisions are made by, there are only eight people that are members in making decisions. And so the the members make the decision for their entire family and they make decisions around the shared use of the land and property and say the way that they share time at the restaurant, if that makes sense. Um, beyond that, I don't, I guess an observation I had is that that cooperative it's fairly homogenous in itself too because it's women of rough uh, typically around the same age making decisions together and i know that sometimes when people are more similar and have you know it lends itself to like they might have similar interests and needs w was it um consensus model i mean it, how did oh, they you, you know, know how I've, what happens if how do they make, you know, um, amongst the members? Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's a good question. I actually didn't ask that. Mm. Okay. Yeah, and I know right now it's an issue because there is a difference of opinion about what to do with the land and, and if people want to leave and be bought out, you know, how some people can do that and others can stay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. And, and divide and who gets what what portion of the land? Yeah. I'm just curious. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Annie, do you just want to ask your question? Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, Amanda, you mentioned on one of your slides that there's pressure to sell to, to hotels. And you mentioned also that some of them would not sell in a, in a no matter how much money it was. I'm curious where that pressure comes from. Is that pressure from frequent asks from people trying to acquire property? Or is it pressure that comes from locals and towns looking for the economic input from hotels? It's the pressure is from developers that are offering, offering people a lot of money for their property. So I think 
the way I interpreted it was that it's very similar to a lot of agricultural land in the U.S. Right. Mm -hmm. Or waterfront property in Maine. You know, a lot of, yeah. for example, the waterfront I work at, people offer them money to sell all the time. And sometimes, like, when you're aging or, you know, if you're in your 70s or 80s it, and you are being offered a lot of money for a property, it's hard to pass up. Yeah. Yeah. And the, with the intertidal access, uh, and is that similar to the intertidal access in Maine? Uh, or is there, are there different rules about it? Oh, that's such a good question. I didn't even think to ask that while I was here, who owns the land? I know they own the land adjacent to the inner title, but I'm not sure if they own the land underneath the farm. One Thank question you. I had um, with regards to both the cooperative and also how it's moving now into the future with kind of this group of almost like matriarchs that is aging. Um, first was, is part of the cooperative labor sharing and then a second part was does it seem like there's a lot of interest from the younger generations to maintain the cooperative or is it split um yeah yeah it's some of the original founders daughters have entered, mm -hmm. have become members of the co-op or work closely alongside their mothers. And, and the entire families are involved all the way down to children. So the reason, mm -hmm. the reason everyone works at the farm and at the restaurant is because they consider it easy money. They make good enough wages there where every single person in the family can be paid and they're still profiting. So it's a really it's still a strong economic opportunity, but seem felt a little uncertain about how they would continue to manage some of that in the future. Mm -hmm. that makes sense. And I did, uh, after I thought about it for a second, I did remember that beaches in Mexico are all public property. Okay. And you actually have the right to walk through somebody's house to get to the beach if they won't let you down. <laughs> wow, that's like really that. different than me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I had I had a quick question. Um, you mentioned that there was housing for women, like near the farm site, um, or like a place where they lived at some point in their lives and I was wondering if you could just elaborate a little bit more on that like was there a certain like life period where they were living close to the farm or you know how, was that also like a kind of a cooperative model were they living together yeah so um, I think the cooperative maybe was at its peak I can't remember exactly in the 80s or 90s but even some of the original members they were farming and they had built homes on the land surrounding the farm. And that's where a number of them raised their children. So like Javier, who I stayed with, he lived at the oyster farm as a child. Um, but there is no electricity out there and there's no water. So um, at this point, everyone has moved back into town. Except for there's one uncle that does live down there, but um, mostly they live in town and commute the 15 or 20 minutes or so. And each of them had their own house. Gotcha. Yeah, thanks. I have another question. Um, so thinking about the, the challenges that you laid out in one of your slides, how was the what or was the cooperative structure helpful in addressing some of those challenges? Do you think there were um, advantages to being part of a cooperative in dealing with those? Hmm. Yeah, I think 
uh, like particularly the issue of development and water quality, I think there was definitely a strength of voice when they're speaking as a cooperative. Also being a cooperative enabled them to form a partnership with a local NGO. Um, so they were able to leverage um, like some support and expertise that perhaps an individual farmer would not have been able to uh, take advantage of. Get a couple of questions coming from the chat. Um, so I'll just read them out for you here. Um, you mentioned tourism as a large industry here as well as ecotourism. Did you see any tourism or st storytelling happening happening with the cooperative or aquaculture in general? Yeah, this cooperative does do farm tours. And there are other types of ecotourism or cultural tour tourism in the area, um, in addition to recreational fishing. And then the and then but I but I think most tourisms are most tourists are retire retirees looking for sun. So there's a lot of like dune buggies and beer and strip clubs and stuff like that. And kind of alongside that, um, when you were at the restaurant, was it like mostly locals or tourists or kind of a mix of both? The restaurant was almost entirely a Mexican citizen. Gotcha. So it was a very local thing or they were coming from other you know people in Mexico also vacation in Puerto mm -hmm. Penasco so they but it, but it was primarily um it was it also had to do with the time of year I was there so I was there at summer solstice if I had right. been there in the winter then the clientele would be more um, people from the U.S. and other countries yeah that makes sense uh and then one other question we had in the chat um, did desalination come up at all in your travels? No. One thing they did make me aware of is a plan for the state of Arizona to pump seawater and uh, desalinate that somehow. And there were concerns about how that would affect phytoplankton health and some of the whale species in that part of the Gulf. I actually just listened to a podcast about that. It's a big issue, yeah. Amanda, I was also wondering if, when you were talking to the women, if they talked about any challenges that they faced specifically in the industry in Mexico because of their gender um, and if you'd be willing to share some of those if they did discuss it. Yeah, you know, weirdly, we didn't really talk about that. That it, it just wasn't a part of our conversation, I think, because I was just happy to be working alongside women that have been doing it for so long. Um, no, I think the only thing I can recall coming coming up is like maybe a story about how someone thought that they weren't strong enough or someone also thought that women were better at oyster farming because they're shorter and they don't have to bend down as far but yeah it didn't it wasn't like that wasn't what we were talking about at all which I really enjoyed it wasn't like that's awesome let's you know we were talking about like family and life and eating food and just enjoying each other's presence that's really cool. Does anybody else have in in the audience or anybody else from the team have any more questions for Amanda? All right. Well, that was a really cool presentation. I love hearing about your experience and everything that you learned. And just, I think seeing the photos is really fun and how they resonate with the industry in Maine. Um, I liked hearing about how your, your farm looks a lot like their farm, but also there are the differences on the intertidal versus 
kind of the floating systems. So thank you so much for presenting and for joining us today. Um, just a reminder to everybody who is in the audience, we do have our next monthly webinar um, in November on the 17th. Again, that's a Friday, as always, it will be from 12 to 1. And that um, webinar will be with Evan Young and Kyle Pepperman talking about their trip to Washington State. And again, that was another trip with the Farmer to Farmer Exchange, which is still a possibility for you if you're interested. So remember to check out our funding. Um, and uh, also remember to check out the MIA um, Minorities in Aquaculture Census on their website as well. So 